clear today, uh, my little system here. So I'm going to uh, put myself on to the chat here and uh, just want to make sure that everybody out there is hearing me fine. Everything's going fine. So morning. Let me. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. So things should be good. Hey, uh, good morning to everybody out there. My name is Frank Ferragini, aka Frankie Flowers of City TV's Breakfast Television and City Line. I am four-time best-selling garden author. Of course, I'm somebody who loves to talk about everything and anything to do with plants, gardening, and I'm here to help you, 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 and you grow a better garden. But at the same time, when you hop on here, you'll see in the questions and or comments a bunch of people interacting and that's the community that we have here that are all people that love to grow things outdoors that have questions about their gardens or plants indoors and or out and that community will also help you answer the questions so if i don't get to the questions and you see something on the chat that you know the answer to or can assist that's what this is all about is helping others that are out there suzanne saying good morning good morning there suzanne uh, suzanne's a fellow gardener who has a garden uh, business up in uh, muskoka I was reading some of your posts, Suzanne. I understand this week you got eaten by mosquitoes, you got eaten by black flies, but as well as when you had the bug suit on, you were heating up in it. And yes, it was an amazingly hot week overall. Hot, not only hot week, but a dry week in southern Ontario. Uh, we're underneath what's called a Rex block, and that Rex block is blocking out uh, a higher a pressure of high a high pressure system and a low pressure system essentially block each other out. And that locks us into an extended period of dry conditions. So if you have planted uh, and you've done planted trees, shrubs, and or annuals, morning, deep morning waterings is key. And if I look at the uh, seven day forecast, there's not a lot, a lot of hold, a lot of rain in sight as well. This is happening at the same time that we have friends over towards the east of us. My good friend, Nikki Jabor, fellow gardener and garden author, uh, had to evacuate her home in the Halifax area because of fires there. And of course, the fires that are happening in the West, things are changing. So at the same time, while you're watering, I want you to remind you that uh, water is the most precious resource that we have. Southern Ontario, we are surrounded by freshwater lakes and we have many, most locations, if not all, have access to plenty of water. However, we need to make sure that we're using our water wisely. Uh, morning waterings, uh, deep, infrequent waterings is really key but there's certain things that you don't need to water. You don't need to wash your driveway. You don't need to wash off your patio stones. Certain things out there that you can be very smart in when you're and how you're using your water. Um, we got our first question of the morning here from Phyllis. When growing perennials in pots, do you have to repot them early? So when you're growing perennials in pots, first off, when you're growing anything in a container with the intention of having it overwinter outdoors in that container, First thing is, is that it's going to struggle being in a pot because that pot will freeze uh, heavier, will freeze thicker, will freeze more solid than what a plant would in the ground because the ground has more soil. It also have more snow load on top and that's more of an insulating factor. So for growing perennials in pots outdoors and let's say in a zone five, we pick a perennial to a zone four. Uh, also really important is watering and watering them all the way through until the frost settles in on that pot. Just gonna get my foot from underneath me. If not, I'll make my foot fall asleep. Uh, if you're growing them pot year after year, they will need to be repotted probably every second year. But even same with your perennials in your garden, every three to five years you should be dividing them. And so not only you're repotting, but when you repot, you can actually split and divide that perennial as well to give it more health. Key with growing in containers, of course, is to make sure that you do have some good drainage that's there too. Uh, we got a question here uh, about transplanting. This is from Lynn. Hi, Frankie. Is it okay to transplant a peach tree right now? Would it drop its fruit? Yes. A couple things. We are dry. So we said about it being dry. It has been fairly warm. The peach trees have already put their bloom on. And right now with their bloom and their fruit pretty much set, if we go to transplant it, the first thing that that plant's going to do is going to try to make sure it survives. In order for it to survive, it's going to drop what's taking the most energy from it, and that would be the fruit. So it will drop its fruit. You could actually allow that fruit tree, that peach tree, to have its fruit, and then in fall, when temperatures are a little bit cooler and we have a greater frequency of rain, so mid-September, do the transplanting then. Can you transplant it? Yes. Will it drop its fruit? Most likely. 
And are you creating more of a risk by transplanting now? Yes, there's a greater risk. If you are transplanting at any time, use a quick start fertilizer. It's the miracle Grow quick start fertilizer. That'll make it focus on its root system. Uh, we got a good morning this morning from uh, Wasaga Beach. Good morning to you as well. We got a good morning from not a far drive from me in Innisville to Joe. Good morning to you. Uh, we got a shout out here this morning too from Ann. Good morning, Frankie. Have a great week with Devo in Florida. Yes, later this afternoon, uh, Devo Brown and myself are hopping on a jet plane and flying down towards Disney World. Uh, on Monday morning, tomorrow morning, we'll be live from Epcot. We do have a segment that's going to be speaking about the horticultural programs, the gardening programs at Disney, and Disney does an amazing job. I'm friends down there with the head of horticulture, which is Eric Darden. There's the Flower and Garden Show that happens every spring. Amazing. The Food and Wine Show that happens at Epcot, which is highest flowers in too. Amazing. Um, there are some of the plantings that they do there based upon, let's say that if you're going to be staying at Animal Kingdom, uh, some of the areas uh, that are the Sahara, so you're doing a, a ride that's through the Sahara, they're selecting plant material that you would actually find in the Sahara. So as much as I'm going there for fun, I'm going to geek out when I get there on the gardens. I always try to meet up with Eric as well uh, from Disney to kind of talk to him about what you've been planting in the parks, what's been working well, because you got a, a reminder is that things can burn out in Florida. It's so hot for so long that many plants out there just can't survive just because of the heat and the sun. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Here we go with another question. Can you totally get rid of uh, leaf curl bug on hydrangea? So the best thing to do with that is, um, so what happens for those that don't know, many times when you have your PG hydrangeas, your Annabella hydrangeas, you're gonna see at this time of the year, all of a sudden the leaves start to curl. If I was to open up that leaf, inside it would be a bug. The reason why the bug is curling that leaf is to protect it from predators. And the reason why it's also curling its leaf is it makes it harder for us to control it with an insecticidal soap. Best thing that you can do is to pick off those leaves, put them right into a, a bag, even a compost bag. You can tie that compost bag and put it in the compost uh, or put it in the garbage and then they'll put a new set of leaves on and they'll be fine. So that's the best way to, to remedy the leaf curl bug. What is eating my beans? Dun, 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 TJ Teresa. Uh, so what could be eating your beans can be uh, several different things. So anything uh, that could be eating the tender leaves, shoots of beans, bean shoots are actually quite uh, tender. So you could have anything from rabbits, if it's a big chew that you're seeing and there's no bean there whatsoever. Could be chipmunks and or squirrels that are doing it. It could be a caterpillar. It could be even now I'm starting to see already June and Japanese beetles that are out. So you really have to really determine what is chewing it and then we'll figure out the solution for it. You can always send a picture to, uh, picture of it to me to frankie at frankieflowers.com. Once again, I'll show you that as well. I think I got the graphic right here. Here are some ways that you can reach me always. So once again, you can go to frankie at frankieflowers.com. I encourage you to join the newsletter. The newsletter will be coming out next week for the month of June. Um, but you can see right there on the bottom, that's my email, frankie at frankieflowers.com. Uh, so let's get back to some of the chat and the questions that are happening out there. Some good questions today. Uh, we got show Rosie saying good morning. Good morning to Rosie out there. My cousin's name's Rosie. She lives in Italy. My cousin, my cousin Rosie Francesca Netanel live in a community called Crotone in uh, Calabria. Uh, and if they're watching, sometimes they do. Good morning to my cousins that are out there. Um, Sandra, would the dry weather make orange spots on my lilacs? Have a good day from the city of Port the Lakes. Beautiful area as well. Some of those orange spots that are on your lilac are not related to, they could be sunspots. So sometimes you can get sometimes sun scorch, but if it's been an established lilac for some period of time, I would doubt that it would be sun scorch. Uh, most likely it is a disease. Uh, it'd be great to see if it is an orange dot, it would be a disease, a fungal disease. Uh, it will actually probably remedy itself over time. Um, key is, is after the lilac finishes its bloom period, which in Kortha Lakes probably just probably at their peak right now. So give it about two to three weeks and then prune the overall size of that lilac down by about a third. Remove any dead stems that are in the center. It's a big job because if it's a big lilac, it could be a big job. Any dead stems in the center and then also selectively prune some of the center stems out so that we can get more airflow. After you're done pruning, your shears should be wiped with bleach. That'll kill any of the disease spores. 
any of those stems and or leaves, discard them, put them to the, the roadside or just get rid of them uh, because we don't want those fungal spores to be sitting around. There is um, a fungicide by miracle Grow. It's just a fungicide. It's, it's a green container that you can spray. But what I would more recommend is doing this pruning and then next spring, early spring, before the lilac actually buds out or the leaves start to crack, is to use a dormant spray kit. And that lime sulfur in the dormant spray kit would remedy any, ex any overwintering uh, disease that's there. So that's some good ways that you can take care of it. Um, Janice, good morning from Aaron. Aaron is a beautiful place. My tulip tree is slow to bud. It's a beautiful tree and to leaf small but green and stressed four bottom branches have died should they be sawed off now so anytime that we have any dead branches we want to remove the branches we want to figure out why that tulip tree is going under stress it has been very dry extremely dry so taking your hose and just putting your hose on a really small trickle like just a trickle of water coming out of it and just setting it right by the stalk or trunk of that tulip tree and just letting it sit there for a few hours. That'll be a nice slow watering that'll soak that area in. And I want you to do that once a week over the next three weeks. Um, so remove the branches, that deep watering. You could do a fertilizing and you can do, you can get a root flock fertilizer, but if you don't have that ability, you can also just get some spikes. Uh, the spikes are not my favorite way to fertilize because they're not immediate, but the spikes of course uh, are better than nothing. So the tree and shrub spikes that you can get as well. Uh, but once again, remove the branches and then the deep watering will be key to make that, uh, that tulip tree survive. Uh, and then we got to figure out what caused the stress. Any construction that happened around it, anything digging, maybe something ate the roots that you don't see underneath. Um, and just kind of look at the leaves and see what the leaves are saying, because the leaves tell you the story of a plant. Hmm. Beautiful. Okay. Um, we got Matthew Amos, my good friend who always hops on. I have a question for you. Are you coming back to Guelph anytime soon? Uh, current plans um, on my event schedule. So my event schedule right now has me, uh, in terms of speaking, where you guys could see me, up in August. I should be just leading in the August weekend. I should be up in Muskoka. Uh, we're just kind of finalizing details on that. At the end of August, I'll be doing another Two Sisters Winery event. That is the weekend of the 27th and 28th. I'll be doing it on the Sunday. Those tickets will be coming up for release very soon. Of course, I'll be here every Sunday. And then with Breakfast Television, uh, they have me kind of here, there, and everywhere. So on a week-to-week -week basis, I don't know exactly where I'm going to be. But Guelph right now, not in the books, but you never know. Maybe something will come up in September for us, Matthew, as well. So good morning to you from Guelph out there. Kathy, uh, what to do with a lavender tree in the fall still in the same spot? So the lavender tree will not overwinter outdoors. So that's basically what they've done. If they've taken a lavender bush and they pruned it up, so they removed, and then they allow the ball to form on the top. So you're basically going, you're getting a lavender and with all the multi-stems and you're pruning the bottom stems to one stem and you're continuing to prune as it starts to form its head and you prune, 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 and then you shape the head on the top. That head on the top, of course, now is completely exposed to the elements outdoors. Uh, you could either bring it into a sunroom, a uh, sunroom that will still see nice sunlight, will get cooler in the evenings during the winter indoors, uh, but won't totally freeze is kind of ideal. If you're trying to overwinter it outdoors, it's not going to do well. Uh, in my experience, uh, I tend not to see them survive outdoors. The only thing that you could do and maybe experiment with this, but I don't feel confident with it, is you could put uh, four posts around it and then put chicken wire around those posts and have those posts extend almost double the height of that lavender tree. Then what we'll do is we'll put clean leaves into that little form that we created and fill that up in late October, almost into November, and that'll put some more insulation around it. And I would actually plant that pot in all in the ground. And then if it does overwinter, we'll pull the pot in the spring and then you can use it from there. So that's how I would experiment. <clears throat> but it'd, better, it'd be better indoors. The key about indoors, the overnight temperature cooling is really important and just don't overwater it indoors. Allow it to dry. That's really most people. Uh, there's Matthew's question as well. Um, that's the lavender question that's there. We got to thank you for answering my question, Frankie. Must have preached it. So no problem. Uh, of course. Uh, T-Bone, 
Uh, T-Bone, my man. Uh, good morning from the Hall of Marsh. Yeah, the irrigation pipes are running on the Hall of Marsh. Uh, the Hall of Marsh, of course, is not far from me. Carrots and onions are grown. Uh, my family farms there, the Riga Farms. Those are my cousins, Peter, John, and Dominic, Giovanni and Dominic. Uh, and speaking to them, they've been seeding the fields, but they've been just putting water on right and behind because it is dry. And for many farmers out there that farm uh, corn, soya, wheat, they don't have the capacity and or ability to get irrigation on. So uh, we're hoping to see some rain out there. So these dry periods, even though a lot of people out there are like, ah, oh, I love it, I can sit by the pool. My ideal day, my ideal day is a 20 degree day with sunshine. As we start to get after sunrise, so we've just enjoyed the sunrise, a nice two to three hour rain pushes in. And then that rain clears out by morning, giving us an overnight low of 10. And then the next day we see the sun again. That is a perfect day. That's my kind of day. Uh, Frank, is it too late to spray an apple tree? Um, no, uh, your apple tree, now the fruit, uh, the flowers are there. You can actually spray with an insecticidal soap. Uh, you could spray still with some horticultural oil if you had some insect problems on there. Um, if you want, you can actually look, you can go online and actually I'm just going to look up something right now and I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to do a little thing. So, so what I'm typing in is organic apple spray program. And then what I usually like to do is I usually like to type in the word university. And the reason why I like to type in the word university is, um, that will allow me to um, look at some of the university studies that are out there where people are not getting paid to do. So here's something that we can take a look at. So you can, this is what's called integrative uh, pest management. So if you go into uh, just with that, with that search that I just said to you, but even if you were just to look this up and look at uh, home apple trees, and then you can look at Iowa, Iowa State University. And here's the integrated approach you could talk about spray schedule for the apple trees you can talk about the timing so here's your dormant there's your, you can take a look at your different tips that you have out there and what you should be watching this is a very comprehensive uh, ways to take care of apples and what i want you to focus on is you can see the organic spray schedule for apples that are here and the reason why i want you to focus on the organic is that here in ontario uh, and pretty much across the country, we're underneath the cosmetic pesticide ban. So we use pretty much organic principles. And what you can see is, for instance, you got the repeat petal, petal fail or petal fall. So that's where you start to see that. You can repeat sulfur or BT. BT, which is BTK, which is what will take care of all your caterpillars. But what I really encourage you to do is, once again, just take a look at spray schedule for home apple trees, Iowa State University. And that will give you a really, really good comprehensive uh, read on that that's out there. And I hope that helped you. Good question, by the way. Uh, we got a good morning from Ottawa. Uh, good morning from Ottawa. I've killed uh, two basil plants, one indoors and out. I purchased one more plant yesterday, going to keep it inside. Help, LOL. I would plant it outdoors. Uh, indoors, they're very hard to, to kind of keep basil growing. This time of year, we have more sunlight, which is good. Basil outdoors enjoys full sun. Uh, it doesn't like a windy location. Basil sometimes will get downy mildew. So some of the basil, if you see kind of a, a brownish leaf on the bottom leaves, that's actually downy mildew. And if you get downy mildew on basil, it's really hard to fix that downy, uh, downy mildew. So making sure that you're buying and purchasing healthy plants. I have seen some plants out there at some garden centers right now with downy mildew already on them. And that's kind of a concern for me because I know it's going to cause problems for home gardeners. Um, I, you know, so just look at, make sure that plant that you're buying that basil or basil plant that you're buying has nice deep green leaves, no indication of any brown spots on the leaves whatsoever. If you're planting plant outdoors in good soil, I would plant it in just a big pot. I would put it in a larger container. For instance, the containers that I grow my basil in here are at least 12 to 14 inches. And I just put one plant into that, uh, on a 14 inch pot, you could put two plants. And then the key thereafter is continuing to cut the basil and use the basil because that'll actually bush out the plant and actually help the plant out. Never let it go to seed or flower. If it starts going into flower, cut those flowers off because that'll give more health and happiness to your basil. That's there. Another good question, by the way. 
Uh, we got a good morning from Oshawa this morning. Good morning from you. Sharon Lloyd is saying good morning and wishing uh, a great week ahead, which I'm thinking we are will. Uh, Paula, my good friend Paula. Are prey mantises a benefit in the garden? I know they will feed on bad exes, but I'm worried about the good ones. Prey mantises are actually a beneficial insect and they're, they're not selective in what they eat. But overall, they're good for managing pests in the, the garden. And generally, prey mantises are ones that generally get most of those pests that are more closer to the ground or those that are climbing on. Um, they, will they affect some pollinators? They can affect some pollinating plants, but if you have a prey mantis, don't discard it. Don't keep it. It's good. It's good. It's going to do more benefit than harm for sure. Uh, Lathia, uh, good morning from Oshawa. Another shout out from Oshawa. Uh, another beautiful place in the province is in Collingwood. Good morning to you in Collingwood this morning. Uh, just south of Collingwood uh, is Orangeville. Good morning to Lori there as well. Uh, Heather is saying a shout out this morning uh, from Newcastle this morning. Uh, we got Another well wishes this morning too from Ottawa. Safe travels and enjoy uh, Disney. I'm pretty much looking forward to seeing all the plant material there. Oh my God. Well, OMG. Let's just say, oh my G. Don't even say. Um, white Christmas cactus has a millions of buds after four years. Don't know what happened, but it's in buds. It's exciting when you see that. So the Christmas cacti, um, they generally flower based upon shortness of days, but it's not just the shortness of days. And now we're going into extended periods of warmer conditions. They tend to flower when they actually have a warm day and a cooler night. So it's the setting of the buds. So the setting of the buds happens when it does get a restricted amount of daylight, but more importantly, that overnight temperature drops by about 10 degrees. And that's when it will set flower. One of the best things to do with Christmas cactus, if they're indoors in your home, is put them outdoors in the summertime in a part sun location. Then they'll be benefited with all that beautiful humidity outdoors, the natural rain when we get rain, but as well in the fall, they'll start benefiting from a warmer day and a cooler night. Then just before frost happens, you bring them indoors and you put them in a room that gets natural light and natural darkness. So just a room with a window that you don't frequent that also gets a little bit cooler at night. And that's the perfect way to have your Christmas cactus set its buds in time for Christmas. Um, good morning. Another shout out this morning. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, to Heather. What a it is a beautiful morning. Uh, so I got to. So here's my plan. I'm going to tell you guys my plan. Right after this, I'm going to drive my two boys up to the family greenhouse because they got to work for nine o'clock. Thereafter, I'm going to come home. I'm going <clears> to <throat> I'm going to hop on my my cycle, do a quick half hour ride. So then that way I feel like I moved. After that, I'm going to cut the lawn because the lawn needs to be cut. I'm going to cut it higher though because I know it's going to still be dry this week. So I'm going to cut it on a four. So that way the, it could shade itself out. I'm going to deeply water all my containers because even though my son is supposed to come by and water my containers when I'm away, you can never trust it. So I'm going to do a deep watering on all my containers. I've already checked into my flight and my goal is to leave here just around the noon hour. So it's going to be a busy morning. So... That's my plan. Thank you. Uh, maybe too much information. Good morning from Burlington. Uh, when is the best time to trim and fertilize emerald cedars? Thank you. Uh, so best time to trim and fertilize is now. You can be doing your pruning uh, now. And we are this week. We do have a few days where we're cooler temperatures. Actually, I haven't, I haven't looked at the updated forecast for here. I've been too focused on Orlando. Well, let me look at uh, EC. I'm just going to, so that way, EC, Toronto. I'm just going to use Toronto as a forecast weather. So let's just take a look at the seven-day forecast, and we'll share this with everybody out there as well. And, you know, we are into more seasonal temperatures this week. So this week would be a perfect week for you to do that pruning. I just want to show you guys the seven-day forecast. If we had temperatures that were 30 degrees, I would not want you to do a pruning on that uh, that cedar so if we take a look that into tuesday wednesday thursday even through to friday we have temperatures that are seasonal around 20 with 10 degrees well they're 11 degree nights little chance of some showers not a whole lot of chance of showers so first step that i would do is do your pruning second second step i would do is a deep watering right in behind that fertilize and then water again and away you go so this is a good week after monday tomorrow's going to be still a hot day at 27 degrees so there you go there. Okay, good question that's there too. I'm liking some of the questions today. We got Linda and Bancroft. Good morning to you as well. 
Um, garden segments are amazing on BT. Marianne, my next garden segment that I'm going to do is going to be on June the 20th. Uh, so we'll be doing it one there. You're going to see some garden segments still coming up, as I mentioned, this week on Breakfast Television. Uh, and that will be on Monday when we're talking horticulture there at uh, beautiful Epcot, which is a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, we have another question here about an insecticide. Lori, does Dawn dish soap work as an insecticide? So some of the home remedies of insecticidal soaps are just that water and a liquid insecticidal soap. And Dawn is one of those that you could use. Key is just to test those on many areas before using because there, you're going to see many different formulations online, but you want to test those so you're not causing harm to your plants overall that are out there. Uh, we got another one that's right here. Uh, one of my maple trees is dropping some of its leaves. What can I do? Hmm. Um, uh, one of the, so Polly is dropping one of its leaves because it's underneath some stress and because it is underneath stress, that could be water. So the first step that I would do is that it's dropping its leaves. Take a look at the leaves themselves. Any marks, any indications that are out there, that's what I would be focusing on. Next thing that I would be focusing on is by doing that deep watering, and that would really help it. Then you can do a fertilizing, but you could also send a picture to it to me as well. So once again, Frankie at FrankieFlowers.com. Sorry, something just distracted me there. And I think I'm going to have to hop off because I got to do one other thing. But I'm going to answer this final question here. I'm going to cut it at about 28 minutes instead of 30. Uh, Penny Moore, good morning. What taller perennial plant would you recommend for a garden which is shaded by a maple tree? So what taller perennial plant that's shaded by a maple tree that would work well in dry shade is ostrich ferns. So the ostrich ferns is a nice green foliage plant that gives you beautiful, beautiful texture and color in shade. And then in front of that, you can then plant some blue hostas if you want it. I love that combination. The ostrich ferns, though, can get very... Now, once they establish themselves, can go everywhere. So they'll spread a lot through that area. But it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful bush. Uh, Sabativa is saying she loves my shirt. Love it too. Not that fancy. I think I bought it at Marshalls or Winners. Uh, Going to give Valerie a shout out here too as well. Must be the year of ab abidies in the garden this year. I don't know what. Huh. Maybe I'm dumb right now, but I'm not. I'm going to see this. Accept or act to be able to, oh, to be able to tolerate. I get it. Uh, yeah, must be the year to tolerate in the garden this year. Too high. I get it. Kind of. I kind of. Sometimes I'm not that smart. Not really. I try. I try hard. Uh, when is the best time? This is the final question that I'm going to go with. When is the best time to prune propagate my snowball bush after it finishes a bloom? The key to any flowering bushes and or shrubs that are outdoor, prune after they bloom and you'll never fail. And never prune no more than a third. Some of them can go to up a half. When you're pruning, I don't want you to lop them. I want you to prune for shaping, select some of the center branches, remove those, any branches that are growing inward, remove them. But right after the bloom is a great time to prune. And then I'll do one more bonus round. Do you have any information or thoughts on the viability of the new yellow lilacs? Are they suitable for Sault Ste. Marie uh, zones? Uh, with any new products that are out there, any new plant material, especially the trees and shrubs, I would wait a few seasons before that you went out and purchased the new. Many of them have been tried and true, but I know that you'll see the word improved. And what, I mean, what that means by improved is that they'll do a release on some plant material, and then they'll see how that does, and then they'll improve it for future years. The yellow lilac in terms of its zoning, I'll look at it. It's gotta do, it's zone three through, uh, no, not that, that's the, the normal. Um, I will, let's primrose. Uh, let me just take a look here, guys. I got to find out what the zoning is on those. It says that it's zone three to seven. So that'd be fine for up there and Sault Ste. Marie. So, uh, and Sault Ste. Marie, you're good. Uh, I'm not totally familiar. I actually haven't grown one yet. So in terms of their habitat, bloom production, things like that, I haven't really even put any in some of the landscapes that I've worked on lately. So I still got to see some recommendations out there as well. So I'm going to cut it right there, guys. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Uh, keep blooming, keep growing. 
Uh, and I will see you next week here, but tune into Breakfast Television this week where you'll see us live right there from Disney.